Welcome to this program of the American Writers Festival. My name is Courtney Borjas, and I am a program coordinator here at the American Writers Museum. I'm here to introduce to you our guests for our next event today. Shelley Williams is a Broadway director committed to cultivating new musicals and devised work. She's directing the upcoming Broadway revivals of Aida and the Wiz, and as well as the premieres of Mandela and the Musical and Indigo. She has a long history of work on Broadway in Rent, Aida, and Motown the Musical. Passionate about pairing social justice with the arts, Shelley is on the steering committee of We Stand United and is a founding member of Black Theater United, an organization committed to dismantling systematic racism on our streets and stages. She's the author of Your Legacy, a new children's book that invites readers to reclaim African American history. She's here today to discuss it with journalist, editor, and educator Ariane Nettles. Please join me in welcoming Shelley and Ariana. Thank you so much, and I absolutely had to bring this gorgeous book up here. Um, when it arrived at my doorstep, I was so very excited to see it. And of course, you know, um, the name of your book is Your Legacy, A Bold Reclaiming of Our Enslaved History. And you wrote it along with, um, and it was, this gorgeous book is illustrated by Tanya Engel, so definitely want to make sure that we mention her name. So when you thought to do this book. I know that it kind of originated from a need that you personally had when talking with your daughter. So can you talk a little bit about how that started for you? Absolutely. The origin story of the book actually started at Passover. Um, my husband is Jewish and I was sitting at Passover with his family and they were talking about their enslaved history as their Jewish slave enslaved history. And after about two or three years of doing Passover with the family, mm -hmm. I thought, why am I not having this conversation with the kids about their African American enslaved history? Yeah. And I realized that I didn't know how to have it and that I, it caused me so much pain and, and so much shame that I needed to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that they deserved to hear it from me. I didn't want it to hear from school for the first time, and I wanted them to have an open dialogue about it. Um, and so I started doing a lot of research, and the conversation that I was really afraid to have became a conversation I couldn't wait to have. Wow. Because the story is filled with so much joy, so much resilience, and I realized that this is a story I must tell my kids. So I, I, I wrote the book. Yeah, yeah. And what is that shift like? I'll set it up because I'm like, this is just, well, I don't want to block us, but this is just a gorgeous book. Um, so what was that shift like? Because I think I, and you know, we'll get into your wide variety, mm -hmm. many of the ways that you are a storyteller in your career. But as a storyteller, I know it's often, I often have that period where I'm starting to do something and I'm like, this is really tough and I don't know if I wanna do it. Like I said, I wanted to write this thing, but I don't know. And then you have that shift where you become so excited to tell that story. What was that like for you? And was there any maybe particular thing that you learned where you said, okay, no, now this is something exciting that I know I can do and I'm excited to tell. Yeah, I had a lot of aha moments. Okay. One, the first one was, I didn't know how to begin the book. And then I realized that the first line of the book is, your story begins in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I realized this whole time we'd been telling stories about enslaved African Americans, we always started on the shores of the Americas. Yes. And we denied the lives that they had prior mm -hmm. to coming here. And, and I realized that if we actually begin with their lives when their families were connected, with them thriving in their own cultures, speaking their own languages, yeah. then it was, it connected so many dots for me mm -hmm. about what I found out when I started researching more. You know, when I saw pictures and I saw movies of African Americans speaking broken English, mm -hmm. I thought they were ignorant it never once dawned on me that they spoke other languages mm -hmm. fluently. Mm -hmm. And so I got really excited to tell that story because I didn't know that in mm -hmm. my late 40s when yeah. I was writing this book. And it changed the way that I saw them. Yeah, yeah. To know that they were expert farmers in West Africa 
made me understand the expertise that they brought to America, true expertise that grew this country. And suddenly I had so much pride in what they did and the value that they brought here in, in their genius, in their excellence. Yeah. And that wasn't the story that I was told. Yeah. I saw people in chains speaking broken English and with lashes on their backs. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I did not think about who they were, only what was done to them. So this book is about who they were. It's a celebration mm -hmm. of their resilience and their ingenuity and their creativity and their grace and their dignity. Yeah, and I think, you know, you bring up a really good point about us being learning more and teaching ourselves more as adults because even perhaps what we learned as children often wasn't as detailed. I'm thinking about like when we would spend days watching Roots, like, you know, at the end of the school year. Um, and it, a lot of it became kind of jokes, you know, mm -hmm. like, like funny things that, you know, as a kid, you may think is hilarious as how something is, but you're not necessarily getting some of that context that can help make you proud, which is why you hear so many people now as adults saying, I don't want to hear any more slave stories. Right. Um, I don't want to hear any more about the pain because we are not used to maybe having pieces of story, pieces of literature, different stories that can kind of celebrate that. And I know that you've also been very clear that you do not say that this is a story about slavery, that this is a story about ancestors. Can you talk a little bit about how that approach is perhaps different to maybe some of the other stories we've seen? Absolutely. You know, I do believe, you know, we can hold multiple truths. So we can tell a story from many different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I wrote this story as a first introduction. Mm -hmm. So this isn't the whole story. And as my children grow, the way that I talk to them about enslavement will grow. Yeah. But I had no way to begin. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this book for me was an introduction. And then as they can handle more, I can deepen the story with them. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I think one really amazing thing that has we've seen over the past couple years is how when we talk to children about our history as, a Afri as African Americans, not just, you know, to us, but about us and about the people who came before us, there's a bigger emphasis on how there, that is a culture. You know, I think that many of us have sometimes felt kind of odd when, you know, you are in school and you're talking about, well, what is your history? What is your culture? And of course, many of us, no matter how hard we may try, we will likely never know perhaps where in Africa some of our family members originated. And it's likely that by this point, we have probably have people in our ancestral line that have been from all over the place mm -hmm. um, as people marry people and other people marry other people. Um, so what do you want your daughters to know about their ancestors? Like what do you want, how do you want the story of our ancestors to kind of empower them as people who have this long tradition in the United States as well as of course our origins in Africa? So I, t I did my ancestry, mm -hmm. and, and I, was, I really did think that when I opened this envelope, I was going to get this incredible aha moment where all the pieces were going to come together mm -hmm. like a, a movie, mm -hmm. right? I was going to open this envelope, and my whole history was going to somehow empower me. And I opened it up, and I saw that I'm from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And I did not feel more whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was like... All I got was a place. Yeah. And I got a couple details about a couple people, but there were still so many holes mm -hmm. in the narrative of the yes. of our history. And I had to tamper my expectation. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing this book, I was thinking a lot about how to frame the ancestors because I wanted to do a family tree. And when I was in junior high school, we did a family tree, it was an assignment. Mm -hmm. And I did it and I was so proud of it. And they posted all of ours on the wall and mine was the smallest of mm. all of my uh, classmates. And I realized I could only go back so many generations. 
And it was a pain that I couldn't quite, you know, like I've never quite got gotten over. Yeah. So in this book, I was like, how can I create a family tree that feels empowering? Mm -hmm. And I grappled with that for a long time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a part of me was like, do I put my names of the ancestors that I know and make up others? And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then I realized even the names of my own ancestors are not the names that their parents would have given them. Mm. Giving someone a name is so intensely personal and taking it away is a real erasure. So I didn't wanna put names in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I realized that maybe we've been looking at this tree mm -hmm. backwards. It isn't about the branches, it's about the roots. Mm. And the last page of the book is my version of a family tree which is the qualities that our ancestors have passed down to us. And to me, the love, brilliance, ingenuity, courage, strength, intellect, determination, dignity, and grace are our roots. We are the manifestation of their struggles. Mm -hmm. We are their dreams come true. We are here because they survived. And that is a beautiful continuation of their story. So I think of their story with a joyful ending mm -hmm. as long as I'm continuing to pass it on and I'm raising my children with all of the qualities that they have passed down to us. Yeah, and I love how, you know, you just pointed out those very strong words. I think especially, you know, when we're talking about children's books, the ability to use strong language that they understand, you know, because I think that if I'm reading this to even a three, four, five year old and they we say the word ingenuity, mm -hmm. that is something that we can teach them if they don't know what it means already. You know, I think I was drawn to how those words stuck out to me as I turned every page and knowing that as a kid, they would have also stuck out to me and how they kind of guide you through this process um, of learning from this, this kind of historical timeline, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I definitely want to chat about is that we sometimes, and I say we as society, um, have a tendency to talk down to kids, you know, think that they are not capable of understanding these complex issues where I have found that especially children today, they are ready, they know how to have conversations, even conversations that we still sometimes struggle with. Mm -hmm. So how did you ensure that this was a book that was kind of having a conversation with children um, and give parents the tool to do, tools to do so um, and not necessarily talk down to them as, oh, you won't understand these complex things? I, I am amazed by the amount of information children can handle. You know, I look at it, you know, you go to a restaurant, you see a two-year-old with a cell phone and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, you've put together this concept. You know, when you push this, this happens and you get a response. Mm -hmm. um, I was amazed when my kids were younger that I could do sign language with them and they would sign back, you know, whether they want milk or more. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that their minds work is pretty incredible. The conversations that, I, that I've had with my children have always been gauged by their age, mm -hmm. but also really pushing them to a point of curiosity. Mm. You know, I wanna remain a deeply curious person. So I don't wanna just meet them where they are. I wanna kind of take them a little bit further so that they are, they wanna ask the next question. Yeah, yeah. So that they want to go further. So there are concepts in this book and there's words in the book where they'll have to say, what does that mean, mm -hmm. right? And then as a parent or as a caregiver or as a friend who's reading the book, you can then insert either your own stories into that or you can pause and have a little bit of a conversation. But I, I really did want it to be an engagement. Yeah, yeah, and it definitely feels that way. And so your daughters, they, you know, they were, of course, the start of this book and this idea to make the book. So when the book came out last September, that well, this past September, what did they think about it? What was their response to the book? Oh my gosh, they, well, they freaked out because their names are in the book. So they were very <laughs> excited about that. Um, and 
And I had read so many versions of it to them mm -hmm. that for them to see the illustrations for the first time and to hold it in their hands yeah. because they were just looking at mommy's computer yeah. when I was reading it to them, they hadn't seen you know, Tanya's gorgeous work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they poured over every page and they would say, oh, that was the line that I told you. Yeah. You know, they, they, they felt like they were a part of it and they very much are a part of every single page. And Tanya's beautiful daughter Zoe mm -hmm. is also a part of every oh, page. Wow. Um, so it, it was really exciting for both of us to share this with our children and, and for them to share it with their friends. Nice. And the cousin. Yes, and the, yes, yes. You know. Take it to school. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. And so I definitely, in a second, want to circle back to, you know, your career in theater. But in the meantime, I think probably many of us are wondering, how do you approach a children's book as an author? How do you write it when you have this wealth of information? Because um, you are writing to a very specific audience images are important in a way that they would not be perhaps in a traditional book so what is that actual process just in case if any of us are interested in writing um, children's books ourselves i'll tell you my process was interesting i had the idea for the book and i'm a theater director as you as you heard and and i went to uh, i told the agency that i was in i really want to write this book and they said you should really focus on directing <laughs> And so I didn't mm. write it. Mm. And like a year or two went by, maybe a year and a half, and I was being courted by another agency. And they said, you know, is there anything else you've ever wanted to do? And the little voice in me, you know, I had two voices. One was like, don't say it. And the other one was like, what have you got to lose? And I said, yeah. you know, I've always wanted to write this children's book and this is the idea. And the person I told it to, their eyes lit up and said, oh my gosh, can I tell that to the literary person? And I was like, yeah, sure, what have I got to lose? Yeah. And then the literary person came in and said, oh my goodness, there's no book like this on the market. You have to write this book. If you get it to me by July, I will sell it by September. And I was like, wow. are you serious? And it was such an incredible lesson for me mm -hmm. because I'd been rejected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if I had listened to that person, that one voice, yeah. this wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. I had to keep listening to my own voice. And I was so grateful that I followed through. And it, it, is, it was a beautiful process and collaboration of working with an editor. And, and I actually had, you know, I said to the, the literary agency, which did not have a lot of African Americans, I said, I really want some African-American scholars to look at this book. Mm, mm -hmm. And so they hired readers for me. Oh, wow. And I got incredible notes. I was like, if I'm, giving, if I'm putting this book out there, I want to make sure that I have done my due diligence and that everyone reading it isn't related to me and loves me. Like, I, yeah. need, I need a real constructive eye looking at this book. So I got some great notes that, that mm -hmm. did go into the book. And so by the time it, it made it into the world, I felt like... I had it pretty thoroughly vetted. I felt like I had really poured over the words. When we looked for an illustrator, if you don't know the process of, of a children's book author and illustrator, the author and the illustrator never have a conversation. Oh, you wow. never meet. Um, so I looked at a bunch of illustrators and I was like, oh my gosh, I love Tanya. And my priority for the book was if I was never going to have a conversation with this person, mm -hmm. I wanted the illustrator to be a black woman okay. and a mother because I wanted her to know why I wrote it. Yeah, yeah. And so I had distilled it down to, I want black woman illustrators. And I saw Tanya's work and it was so deeply layered. It didn't feel like a children's book. It felt like a piece of art mm -hmm. and I wanted children to look at this, families to look at this, adults to look at this and continue to see wow. all the layers, all the many, many, you know, it's, it's, it's so deep, this mm -hmm. history. Yeah. So I wanted people to come back and look at it and notice something they hadn't noticed before. Even something as simple as, I really fought for gold leaf to be on the front of the book, mm. which is not something that's typically on a children's book. Absolutely, yeah. But I, I said, you know, we've been separated from the natural resources of Africa. Mm -hmm. 
And it's, it will send a friendliness cue to, to African Americans who read this book to mm -hmm. see the gold on that book, yeah. the richness of Africa on this book. Yeah. And I'm really grateful that Abrams said yes. And, yeah. you know, tiny details. Yeah. And those things also make it very different. You know, besides just the, if you go into a bookstore with your kids, what they will actually pick up or what they will be drawn to, you also have um, kind of those subtle messages that it says. And, you know, I know we've been talking about like your kids and I'm a mom and, um, I'm always, of course, thinking about black kids, but I also am thinking about black kids' interactions mm -hmm. with all kids and how a book like this can really be an educational tool. I actually did a panel where I moderated with some really cool kids. They were like seven and eight, and these were some really smart kids. And it was around Black History Month, and I was talking to them about what do they think, you know, what, what have they been learning in school? And both of the kids said, well, I mean, what we've been learning in school is okay, but let me tell you what they got wrong. My teacher failed to say this, and then we didn't do this because I read this in books. And so, you know, thinking through how these books can actually educate all of our children, how to understand all of our history, how to celebrate each other, um, one of my friends, Jacoby Cochran, who's actually moderating another panel at this festival, I remember him saying that, you know, he wants everybody to celebrate all of our cultural milestones, right? We're in a city like Chicago. Yes. We have this amazing culture, amazing culture is everywhere, right? So thinking, you know, back to, of course, you know, you mentioned your children also have Jewish heritage and they are in class, in school with other kids. Have you seen them mention any interactions with just all types of kids who they may have actually introduced to this book? Oh yeah. Um, my girls are not shy about anything. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. They're very quick to correct gendered language. Mm -hmm, they're very mm -hmm, quick to, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're very quick because they have been raised in a world in which limitations have not been imposed on them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so their liberation is somehow also mine. Yeah. As they remind me that I also can navigate this world as a person outside of gender, yeah. you know, imposing gendered ideas on that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to enslavement, yeah. the way that they talk about it is through a lens of empowerment. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can you you can tell the story of enslavement without impugning. Yeah, you can tell it in a way that 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 is celebratory of the accomplishments and the extraordinary intelligence of our ancestors. Yeah, of yeah. their love, of their grace. That is, you know, there's that was so freeing for them mm. to be able to say, I want to tell a story about Ellen Craft. Yeah. And they're like, who's Ellen Craft? We know who Harriet Tubman is, mm -hmm. but who's Ellen Craft? Mm -hmm. They're like, she's a genius. Let me tell you how yeah. she escaped. And, and to know that they have a, a story about another woman who yeah. escaped. You know, they're, to talk about all the amazing innovators, the inventors that we don't hear about. Mm -hmm. We're not hearing mm -hmm. stories about Lewis Latimer. We're not hearing stories. There would be no light bulb without Lewis Latimer. Yeah, yeah. You know that we're not. So they're so excited to talk about the innovation, the genius of African Americans that often didn't get patents, mm -hmm, whose mm -hmm. families did not get the wealth passed down yeah. to them. But it did not. You know, as I say in the book, they could not take away their genius. You could take away their wealth, but mm -hmm. the genius you could not take away. Yeah. So it's really incredible for, for me to see them have such pride mm -hmm. and be able to answer questions and yeah. bring something new to the table that aren't in the typical, mm -hmm. you know, five stories you hear at Black History Month. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm just imagining all the kids reading this and going home and telling their parents all that they've learned um, and sometimes telling the teachers, which is also a great way that we can teach each other. Mm -hmm. um, we, learn, we can learn a lot from kids and what they, what they learn and what they listen to. So I actually want to shift a little bit 
to your work in theater. And um, I heard you say on an interview one time that you have come to the point where you realize that you are a storyteller mm -hmm. and that that will take place in many different mediums and a lot of different types of stories, but that you know that your role is to tell stories. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I, I had to really embrace that moniker when I wrote this book because I know a number of children's book authors and they've written, you know, 30, 40 books and I'm amazed by them and I feel there's something about a children's book author that I feel particularly close with because they've been with me and my children. <laughs> I just was, you know, saw Andrea Beatty and I was like, hi, yeah. you've been in my, like, I feel like you've been in my house so many yeah. times. Like it, it feels so, so comforting to know them. And, um, and I, I, it was, I felt a little bit like imposter syndrome. Mm. I was like, am I allowed to play mm -hmm. in this yard? Am I allowed to do this? And, and what I had to do was kind of surrender to the fact that I too have a story to tell. Yeah. And that I have been telling stories in a different medium for a long time. And the thing that I do know is how to engage and who my mm. audience is. The, the thing I knew when I was writing this book is you know when you're deciding if you're going to write it in first second or third person mm -hmm. i knew that i wanted whoever the reader was in the read aloud to be speaking directly to the child mm -hmm. so it's always you and your mm -hmm. throughout the mm -hmm. entire book mm -hmm. so it feels like a personal conversation between the reader and the yeah. child and so i wanted my voice to be out of it and for when you're talking to your child mm -hmm. that it's just the two of you together yeah um and so i knew that as a storyteller and that liberated me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's the same thing that I say to young people when I'm you know, talking with them in their classrooms when I read the book. Like, you know how to tell a story. Yeah. You know how to tell a story about how you didn't break that glass. Like, you kids oh, know how yeah. to tell a story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why you were late. You know, for, <laughs> I'm like, you know how to tell a story. So, you know, whether you're telling a story on paper, yep. whether you're telling a story in your oral history, mm -hmm. the fact that you can own that, we all own that yeah and the idea that we can collect our stories that when we lean into with real curiosity and we're asking our family about relatives mm -hmm. about moments about recipes about songs that we are actually collecting these beautiful gifts yeah. that we can then pass on and so i really encourage young people and you know people my age mm -hmm. everyone let's start learning our stories yeah. let's start collecting these gifts because those stories are our legacy yeah yeah and i know you mentioned having a little bit of imposter syndrome which you know i think many of us can relate for those from those times where you're like you actually want me to do this thing you know um but because we didn't specifically mention it when we started, you started as an actor and a mm -hmm. dancer and really being an on-stage presence before you made a shift to directing and kind of writing plays. So what was that shift like? And does this shift into writing something that is like a print thing that you can hold, does it mirror that was it is it similar to that same shift or did it feel completely different every shift so i spent 10 years on broadway um which was incredible as an actor and the end of my journey um performing really came about because i had never i always played mm. an african-american woman in every show mm. that i played um but i had never worked with an african-american director and so I was always being told by white men how to speak, how to act, how to sit, how to stand, how to walk, how to dance. And I was like, wait, that isn't, like 80% of that isn't true. This right. isn't what I, but I didn't have any autonomy. Mm -hmm. When you're an actor, you have to do what you're told. And yeah. so I realized I actually want to be the person I wish I had. So I became mm -hmm. a director so that when I start telling stories that an African-American woman can say to me, mm -hmm. you don't have a problem with this line. And I can say, yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, so I, I have loved being a director so much mm -hmm. and I, it brings me incredible joy. When it came around to writing the book, I realized I had something to say. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. you're a director, you're directing someone else's words. 
So I went from like not having any say to now telling somebody else how to do something else that someone else says to now have actually singing mm -hmm. my own words. So it's been a real evolution for me. And each one has its own power. Okay. Um, and each one has its own, you know, they're, they're all different in, in their own ways, but they're all really important. Yeah. You know, you may never know who wrote the words, but you might see the movie and love and mm -hmm. empathize with the character because the actress was so wonderful. You might see the play and be so moved by the direction that you want to tell that story or it affects you so deeply you feel. You might read the book to your child and that might be something that you cherish as a beautiful memory. Yeah. So the impact as a storyteller in all of those disciplines, I think, is is not one's not better than the other. Yeah. It's just yeah. been a part of my own evolution. Yeah, yeah. And so I know that this is this book baby is new, right? Just came out in September, so not many months have passed. But is it too soon to ask you, do you have plans for any more like print writing type of projects? I do. I do. There is going to be a board book based on your legacy. Mm -hmm. And I actually started um my second book and I was all the way through it. It was actually beginning to be illustrated. Mm -hmm. And I, and I said, no, actually I want to, I, I really want to stay on this legacy theme. Mm -hmm. Um, because I feel like when you, when we think about legacy, we often think about it at the end of a journey. We think about someone's life and you're like, oh, this is their mm -hmm. legacy. And so I, I am almost done with my second book, which is uh, a, for a little bit older readers. But it really is this idea that your legacy begins with your acts of kindness. Mm. And that the thing that someone could remember is something that you did when you were in the second grade. Yeah. That your legacy begins at any age. Yeah. So kind of planting the seed that we are creating our legacy from our very first beginnings of kindness is what my next book is about. So what age range would you say that that might be? If somebody has slightly, you know. Well, the next book I have, it's about a little girl who wakes up on her eighth birthday. Okay. So that's the, gotcha. that's where I'm setting it. We'll see, you know, after it goes through the editing yeah, process a thousand yeah. times where we end up. Yeah, that's and the, and the board right book now. will be for, for toddlers. Babies. Yeah, yeah, for the babies, babies. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, I think it's important when we think about growing with a book and growing with our favorite authors and with our favorite stories and being able to kind of target that. I think we've seen that with like Born on the Water, like kids getting that version and the adults getting the 1619 Project book. And so yeah. kind of how these books pair together. How I'll speak to each other. I'll yeah, tell you something, yeah. that I, something that when I was interviewing with, pub, with different publishers, Something they told me at Abrams, which really kind of blew me away, is they said there are certain books that you give to kids. There's like three books that you often give to kids at graduation. Mm -hmm. And they said, we see your legacy being a gift that you would oh, give yeah. to a child at graduation. Oh, yeah. And that really struck me. And as I was going through, you know, the final editing process, I thought, could you read this to an eight-year-old and an 18-year-old? Mm. Would an 18-year-old take these words? Mm -hmm. And does it feel like it could fit both of them. So I was mm -hmm. really thinking about, could it be empowering through a life? Yeah, yeah, and, a, and something to pass down. Yeah. So, you know, we have our favorite books. Um, my cousin just had a baby and I remember we were going shopping and she went to look for a book that her mom had read her mm -hmm. when she was a baby. And so we, we have these fond memories and these connections, we're able to pass it down to our children, to our mentees, to our cousins and nieces and nephews and all all of the little people in our lives who we love so much. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to, I want to make sure that we don't miss this because yes, you are in Chicago today talking about this book, but you're going to be coming back here and you're going to be spending a lot of time with us this summer. So can you talk a little bit about what's coming down the pipeline? Yes, I'm going to be back in Chicago at Chicago Shakespeare. The beautiful book, The Notebook, is turning into a musical, and I'm co-directing that with my dear friend Michael Greif. So it will be making its world debut at Chicago Shakespeare in September, and so I'll be here for a couple months, and, and I love Chicago. Uh, my best friend is here, Suzanne, and I got married in Chicago on her rooftop, so oh, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm, I do love Chicago a lot.
Oh, that's so great. And I will just, you know, let you know that the last time I saw a musical at Chicago Shakespeare Theater, I saw it three times and I now know every word. Um, so I am looking forward to doing the same with the notebook. Um, it's a beautiful show. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple more minutes before we open it up for um, questions. And so I guess my last official question for you here would be, what do you want parents and or any guardian, right? Grownups, I, I try to work on my language and say, you know, I'm always like kids and they're grown up, right? Yeah. Um, and that can look many different ways. So us as grownups and our favorite kids that we love, when we read this together, what should we take away from this? What should we walk away after we read this with our kids? I always think of books as gifts. And I think it's a, a time for connection. It, it's, it's such an intimate thing to share a book with mm -hmm. someone. Um, and so I hope that, that the book opens doors to conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, I hope that by the end of this book, you're beginning your own journey and that it's opening a door to that. So I always think about, you know, when I read the book, that the, that the end of this book mm -hmm. is the beginning of, did I ever tell you about when grandma mm -hmm. or when uncle or when, like that's my hope for the book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that it leads to an and. Um, and, I, and I have loved watching kids pour through it on their own. You know, I, I've seen, I've been, you know, at the library and seen mm -hmm. someone pick up the book, which is such a crazy, amazing feeling. Yeah. And then I'm kind of like stalking some weird kid. <laughs> and they're like, who's that lady? Like, <laughs> right, you're like, you me. like that book. <laughs> and, like, and they just, I watch them like, look at the words and look at the pictures. And I just think, you know, I wanted every single one of those words and those pictures to be yeah. empowering. So I think about like, what is the energy jumping off the page and how does it make them feel? And is it bringing them joy? Is it making them curious, which is my very favorite word. Yes. So that's, that's, what I, that's my hope for the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will pass it back over for our Q&A. Yes. First of all, thank you guys so much for that wonderful discussion. It was amazing to hear. <laughs> so yes, I want to open it up to any Q&A. If anyone has a question, you can just stand over by our microphone over there, line up and speak in. And, ask away <laughs> so i wanted to thank everyone so much i love this museum uh i've been here a couple times and i hope this gets some more uh, uh foot traffic in here because it's really a wonderful resource um thank you that was a terrific job uh mediating it was really interesting shelly what was um the most difficult uh thing about deciding to write the book and then writing the book and what did you learn what was the most important thing that you learned um, either about yourself or, or something else as part of the process. The hardest part about writing the book was really figuring out how to do it. I kept thinking that there was going to be this easy way in. <laughs> so I was like, hey, how did you talk to your kids about enslavement? And my friends were like, girl, I don't know. You know, like, <laughs> we're, we're still, and I, that was what was shocking to me was that no one had that, that, oh, this is what I say. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I have to be the one to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was the hardest part. And then, you know, as I said, when I realized that very first line, your story begins in Africa, I was like, okay, the framework of this book is from the perspective of free people. And then how do I thread their freedom and their liberation throughout their struggles? How do I continue to show their excellence? what they brought with them, who they were at their core, not what happened to them, but who they were. That's where the joy is. And that was, you know, it was a lot about, you know, how do we, how do we carry multiple truths? The truth that I wanted to talk about was the truth of joy. I wanted to center the book on blackness, mm -hmm. which is very different than centering it on whiteness. I wanted to center it on blackness. And so I was really thinking about the joy, the ingenuity, the grace, the dignity, all the things that we don't normally see in an enslavement narrative. And, and, I, and I was really thinking about 
how do those conversations then um, create a fuller, more richer palette for the other conversations that will come? Can I ask a follow-up question? Go right since, ahead. Since no one else is in line. Go right ahead. Um, in this really scary time in which we're now banning books and burning books and, and not teaching history because real history might make someone feel bad, um, I, I find that um, this book is so inspiring and it, it no one feels bad. I think every it, it, it does teach history in a way that makes everyone feel good and, and on, want to honor this history and learn more about it. Uh, are you, does, does this moment in time as you're writing your next book, are you thinking about that and um, how, to, how to navigate that at all? Or is it, I'm not gonna worry about that or how do I get this message to it, places that need this history? Yeah, I thought about it a lot. It's the reason why I totally abandoned my second book because I was like, this book will never get published or it won't be seen, right? And so why am I creating something that I know is gonna be banned before it even comes out? Um, it doesn't mean that that book won't come out, but I thought if I wanna make an impact, then I really need to be strategic and thoughtful about the way that I'm making it. And um, there are not many things that I can say that I'm afraid of. There are conversations I think that are infinitely more difficult that I've had with my children about you know, even the various drills that they have to have in school, which is tough. Things that we never had to experience. You know, fears that we have to bring to them and talk to them about and make them feel safe in a world that is ever changing. So I don't fear words. I don't fear, um, I don't, fear anything that I know as a parent, I can empower them. Um, and I do remain curious, and I think that that's what I want them to be. I want them to be curious. I want them to ask lots of questions. I want them to know more. I wanna be in a world where I'm not trying to make them know less. I want them to look around and notice things and ask about things. And even if they are difficult things to talk about, my children walk down the street and they see someone living on the street. It hurts them deeply to see that. And they ask questions and we have conversations about mm. that. Those are not easy conversations, but that's why I'm the adult. <laughs> because I can model behaviors that are brave and I can also curtail the conversation in ways that they can handle it. And then I can deepen the conversation when they're ready for that. So I think it's incumbent upon us to, you know, those of us who do believe that, you know, we're in really interesting times, that no one actually can tell us what our kids can and can't. We are actually the ones who tell our kids what they can and can't. And, and that is, is something that I, I take very seriously. Awesome. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm so sorry that I'm late. I really want to see this part, but I do have a question and just is follow up with what you just brought up actually. Um, how do you find a balance on what things to talk about when the kids are ready? Because like I'm writing like kids, children's books. Mm -hmm. So I want to also bring up like questions or things that are, you know, like what they see happening around them, what they experience, like based on your experience, what is a good strategy? to do that, to gauge that. Can, can you ask a question one more time? What is the strategy to engage? Uh, to, to, uh, to, get, uh, to gauge um, the topic that they're ready to talk about and how deep those conversations can go. You, you know, know, I follow their lead. Are you talking about as a writer or as a parent? As, as a writer. As a writer. Yeah. So my, um, my focus group is my dinner table. <laughs> my tutes are 10 and 11. And if, I, if it's on the news, they know it. There's just no way around it. Between the bus, between, you know, as much as I, you know, curtail their devices as much as I can and make sure that they're not, you know, they don't have the TikTok back, but somehow or another they know everything that's on TikTok. Um, they know. And so I'll ask them, hey, what do you think about this? And I'm shocked by sometimes the things that they have absolutely wrong 
or the very strong opinions they have about something that really should be more nuanced. You know, they, like us, like adults, want to bucketize and say something is all good or all bad. And so really creating a landscape in which they can begin to see more sides of something and they can not be quick to, you know, talk about, you know, canceling people. <laughs> Kids are the quick to be like, you're out, right? And so really saying, saying to them, you know, how do we educate? How do we grow? How do we create space? And how do we make sure that the conversations can continue to flow? So, uh, you know, I ask them questions and I assume that they are more aware than we think they are. And if they are, am I the person giving them the information to level set what they know or don't know? Or am I assuming that they're walking around in a bubble, which is actually never true, at least in my home? Oh. Thank you so much for that and one more follow-up yeah. question. So um, in terms of, you know, like, um, I guess I just need to put it out there and just, you know, like be brave enough because like um, what feedback or what suggestion or advice that you can give a young writer or author to overcome that fear? Because like sometimes the question of it, it's, it might be, not appropriate for some people, the the theme, you know? So should we, is it appropriate for this time? I guess is my question, you know, like how do you gauge to determine when to put out your work or any time is good, basically? You know, I do believe that you always have to be true to yourself and be brave about the story that you want to tell. And you may have to be creative in the way that you want to tell it. I have found, at least in this book, the way my way in was not to impugn, but to empower. And so I was talking to a very specific audience of African-American children. All children can read and learn from the book, but I was very specifically talking to African-American children, saying this is a bold reclaiming of your history. And this is how I want you to meet your ancestors. And, you know, there is the, the page on 1619, boats were taken, you know, came to take your ancestors away and they didn't know where to go. They didn't know where they were going and they were very afraid, right? And then I say they were separated from one another, but it was the love that made new families come together and they cared for each other as new families. So I told the truth. But then I talked about the incredible generosity of strangers reaching out to each other and saying that we love each other. We are not going to navigate this alone. And then talked about what did it mean to create a language made of so many different languages. The genius, the intellect to say, what is that? Learning what these words mean and then combining them together to make a new language that wasn't everybody learned my language, I'm going to teach you. The generosity of saying, let's take a little bit of yours and a little bit of yours and a little bit of yours and now this is our language. Like finding the ways in that highlight the incredible survival and the generosity and the genius and the love, because that to me is the greatest motivator because you cannot hate and anger your way through a life, but you can love your way through anything. So that's the gift that, that I think about when I'm writing for my children, when I'm talking with my children and when I'm navigating my own journey. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks You're welcome. Everything. I was going to say, what a beautiful way to end that program. <laughs> Thank you to all our program participants for being here today and for allowing us to celebrate American writing safely and in person. You guys, again, can help me thank Shelly and Ariane. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.